this morning you get to uh, share in, be a part of uh, uh, one of, in my way of thinking, uh, one of the most misunderstood passages of scriptures that we deal with. Mainly because we only deal with half the verse. And that's not good scholarship. You have to deal with the whole verse and the whole context of what is actually being said. Um, I, I wish it was as simple as some people want to make it out to be, but um, I, I think that God doesn't require a lot from us. And I know some people are going, what? Um, all he really requires of us is that we die to ourselves and live to him. <laughs> Pretty hard to do considering we're selfish, self-seeking, self-desiring individuals. Last week we touched on this verse. I'm in Romans 8, continuing to preach through that chapter. We read this. The Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with with the will of God. Before we go any further, I want to retouch that up just a little bit. The Spirit intercedes on our behalf for God's will. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to take it a little bit further, but how many of you, just show up hands real quick, how many of you have asked for God's will in your life? It's pretty much unanimous. But there could be a problem with that. <laughs> right, exactly. Because the, the minute you ask for God's will, that might not line up with our will. Amen? Yes. God, I want to your will. Okay, my will is that you remain single all your life. And so. Could we move to B, please, God? No, no, we're stuck. When you get A worked out, we move on to B. Oops. So we modify. I use that particular illustration because everybody went. <laughs> when you pray for God's will, you have to be prepared for God's will. And a lot of people never live out or, or walk in God's will because what God has willed for them, they refuse to do. The Holy Spirit is going to intercede on your behalf for God's will. Amen. So it's not just a, oh boy, the Holy Spirit's going to do whatever I ask Him to do, like genie in the bottle. He's going to give me my wishes, and that's really cool. Well, that's the mindset that some people take into the very next verse. So let's go there. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Now, if you look closely at that verse, there's not a period at the end of love Him. There is a comma. Which goes on to say... Who have been called according to His what? Will. His will or His purpose. Oops. Uh, that changes the way you look at it. I, I've heard a lot of people teach on this and, and, and preach on this and commentaries on this. And it stops as if there was a period at the hymn. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. Now, if you put a period there, this is the way that gets interpreted. God's going to work everything out for my good. My good. Me, myself, and Irene, I think was the movie, but nevertheless. So and people say, listen, you just need to know that whatever you're going through, God is going to work that out for you because, and here's the way it's phrased, because He loves you. 
And if you love him, and he loves you, there's nothing you can eat that you won't gain weight. Yeah, man, I mean, because, you know, I like pizza, and obviously it's God's will for me to eat pizza, so I'm not going to gain weight if I eat pizza. Because he wants what's good for me. Unless you're a diabetic. And now how do you harmonize, oops, I'm a diabetic, and where I could used to eat the whole pizza, I can only eat two pieces of pizza now. Because for those of you that don't know anything about it, oh, pizza will throw your blood sugar way up. So wait a minute now. God's supposed to be working this out for my good so that I can eat all the pizza I want to. But if I eat it, he gave me a disease that will kill me if I eat it. So what is God doing? You lose a loved one and you say, wait a minute, how is this, my, my husband of 50 years just passed away, how is that good for me? God. Well, the answer may be, well, you never really cared for him that much, but I don't know. I, I, this verse to them. Let's read the second part. For those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. God's will, God's purpose, those are two entirely different things than Barry getting all the pizza he wants. Or trying to fix what we don't understand and say it's all going to work. Now, if you were to ask me, is everything God doing on uh, my behalf so that everything is going to work out if I'm aligned with His purpose, my answer to that is yes. Absolutely. But here's where the shift has to take place. It's not I that live, but Christ living in me. Galatians 2.20 He's going to accomplish what is best for me according to his purpose in my life. Y'all remember the story? I got Bell's palsy. I was taking the steroids to, cure, to help me with the Bell's palsy when we found out I was diabetic and that kicked me into a diabetic state. And the truth be told, I probably was flirting with diabetes for the last five, ten years maybe. I don't know. But that blew it to where I can now begin to take a pill, not have to take insulin. I learned to eat properly, lost 75 pounds, and God is still working on that. That's, that's, that was my part. But here's the question I want to ask you. Did Bell's palsy hit me for God to say, wait a minute, I'm going to work this for your good because I'm going to save you so that two years from now you're not dead? <clears throat> My answer to that question is, yes. Absolutely. And some would say, well, it's just coincidence. <clears throat> no. God's will to pray for God's will. Now, ask me if I like not being able to eat more than two pieces of pizza. The answer to that question is no. And sometimes I eat more and I have to deal with it. You're seeking God's will. You have a promise that God says everything that's coming your way will be for your good as long as you're seeking my purpose. And that purpose may be to bring into your life glory, and we're going to read about that in a little bit. Now, some of you, I, I know stories about people that some of you don't know. 
But being the all-encompassing pastor that I am, <laughs> when I find out certain things, they become free material. So at any moment in a sermon or a lesson, you could become that material. And today, the two subjects I have are here. Oh, joy. There's two people who I, Sandy and I, and, and all of you, we dearly love them because of who they are. But these two people lost spouses. And that's a very difficult thing. Wouldn't we agree, amen? I mean, struggle with that. And I'm sure through the, the both of them, through what they were going to have to deal with, was like, well, that part of my life is done. But it was great. Now, these two people happened to go to grief counseling. Seems like a good idea, right? I mean, I think it's a good idea, don't you? Didn't know each other. Had, didn't have a clue. That when they walked in the room, God had already plowed the ground. <laughs> Amen? He was just waiting to drop in the two seeds. Here they come. In heaven, this is going on. Watch this good. Because, see, they're going to grief. They're going to deal with their grief. They're going to deal with their grief. They don't have any idea that God has a whole other plan for them. But both of them are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. I started to say they, were, they are religious, but they are not. Because religion won't get you to this place. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ will. So they walk in. I don't know, how long, I don't know the, all the details of the story, but I do know the end of the story. Dick and Roz are sitting right there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I guess they were just lucky to stumble into a relationship. <laughs> I'm not even going to give her a chance to talk. You know? <laughs> According to his purpose, they're seeking to deal with their grief. They're seeking to deal with trying to find out what God wants for them. How do we get through this? God says, I got a better plan. I'm going to put you two together to get through it together. Isn't that God awesome? Man? See, that's how his will works out. When you're seeking his will, and you're moving according to his purpose, what we see is disaster. God can turn into a victory. He can seize it. You see, because we can't. And under our power, most of the times, we mess it up. But under His purpose, all things work to the good. And I'm saying all things. If you're seeking God, no matter what you are going through, if you're living according to His purpose, all things will work out to your glory. Let me go on. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Here's the second part that's so misunderstood. Because people hear the word predestined, they've been taught in the religious world that predestination is like this. God has already worked out, and he has, but you have free will. You're predestined to go to heaven or you're predestined to go to hell. Now that seems crazy, doesn't it? But that is actually a teaching. There are countless denominations who believe that God has already picked who's saved and who's not saved. See, because if you, if you take the position that God has picked, predestined, everybody that's going to go to heaven, then the flip side of that coin is you've got to say that he's picked everybody that's going to hell. Amen? Does that, does that make sense? But if we have free will, we row that canoe ourselves. He, it doesn't say that he predestined anybody to go anywhere. What he says is that those that were called who accepted Jesus Christ have been predestined to conform to Jesus Christ. That's how it works. You don't get it to work any other way. 
You have to conform to Jesus Christ and pattern your life after Him. Walk after Him. Walk under the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You don't get to be predestined because you're somebody special. John Calvin was the father of this. He's the one that came up with this theory. Some of you may not know who John Calvin is, but he's at the heart of Calvinism. And he was, to his major defense, he was struggling against the Catholic Church, which at this time taught that the only way you can be saved is by the good deeds you did. By works. I don't think I'm offensive there to anybody. I hope not. But I think that is a historical fact. At least most Catholic people I've talked to would say amen to that. Amen. 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 So Calvin went to the other extreme. He said, we don't have any, we still don't have anything to do with it. God picks. And he uses words like called. See, that can be confusing. Those who God called, he predestined. Well, that's, the call is going out right now. I'm making a call. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want you to do that. That's what we mean by call. We don't mean, oh, by the way, Troy gets to go to heaven, Karen not so much. <laughs> How would that work? To me, that makes God a beast. I mean, you just get to... You get to pick and choose. And it's the other thing that I have never met in my entire life. I've never met this person. I'm sure they exist. I've never met them. I've never had an encounter with a guy who can say, Hi, John. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm a pastor. Oh, man. Sorry, dude. I'm going to hell. <laughs> John, what do you mean you're going to hell? I'm going to hell. How do you know you're going to hell? Well, God said so. God, God told you you were going to hell? Yep. Well, how come? Well, because my brother's going to heaven. How do you know your brother's going to heaven? Because he goes to church all the time. And he loves Jesus. And he just is the most religious person I've ever met. You're not religious? No, I'm not religious, man. I, I don't like all that stuff, dude. So obviously, God picked me to go to hell. I'm predestined to go to hell. So where are you headed? Go to Hooters, you want to go? I mean, that's... <laughs> Wait a minute, how does that theology work? But that's the way, exactly the way it has to work. But I've never met that person. I've met, I've met a person who said, I care less about your religion, your Jesus, anything. If I go to hell, I go to hell. I've met those people. But I've never met anyone who said, I'm predestined to go to hell. God chose me to go to hell. I've never met that person. So wouldn't it make sense if all you people know you're going to heaven, that there's got to be somebody out here who knows they're going to hell because God picked them? See, it's a funny stick that had two ends to it. So he said those that he called, he predestined to be conformed to Jesus. Jesus is the standard bearer. But he's there. Everything that we align and, and uh, we, we say to ourselves, ooh, that's who I want to be like. Let me tell you something. If you're looking in the spirit world and you want to be like somebody, be like Jesus. Because that's it. Oh, no, that, that took a post too high. No, 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 man, that's it. You get that choice, you don't get any. We're to conform to the likeness of Jesus. And we use the term predestined. He means that's it. That's already been set. God is saying, I predestined you to be the image of Jesus before the world was even created. You follow him. And Paul saying, don't follow me. And for goodness sake, don't follow Barry in the future. Oh, come on, folks. You know, that's, the bar is too low there. Let's follow. Oh, I have an idea. Let's follow Jesus. <laughs> And that's where we get off the track. And that's why it makes it confusing to understand some of the scriptures. Because here again, we make it all about us. And it was never about us. And yet, we stay there. He says, conform to the image of his son, that he might, Jesus, be the firstborn among, uh, among many brothers and sisters. And I love this, that Paul uses the term brothers and sisters. 
See, but all, all you people that think Paul hates women, you don't understand Paul. You don't have a clue about it. Because you love chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, but then you want to talk about that he doesn't know anything about love. Because he hates women. So he says, all brothers and sisters, we're all to conform to them. Now, let me go on. And those he predestined, he also called. Here again, the term called is to bring forth. To bring forth. I got a specific task for you to do. Come here. That's the call. People talk about the call into ministry. I love Professor Hay, uh, who taught us preaching and church administration. He said, The Lord calls preachers to preach. The problem is, some of them should answer the phone. <laughs> Amen. So you're being called. Now, because he's predestined you, he's called you. Individually, you are called. Listen to what And those he called, he justified. I'm calling you to be conformed to my son. And oh, by the way, I've justified so that you could be there. I believe it was in 1980, well, I could be wrong, 5 or 86. We're in Park, Florida, where I was pastoring at the time and with the police department. We held the Junior Olympics in, in, that, in the Orlando area. Uh, Winter Park had the track and field events. It has one of the nicest tracks in the entire country as far as high school students are concerned. Junior high. So, um, they, I got this message in my box at the police station that said, mandatory meeting, such and such, in the uh, city commission chambers. And so the lieutenant was sitting at the desk, and I walked by, and I said, LT, does this include me? And he said, Padre, was it in your mailbox? <laughs> yes, sir. Are you a member of this? Police Department? Yes, sir. Then yes, that meant you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. See you at three. Yes, sir. So at three o'clock we showed up. And they went through all the these are the responsibilities, da 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 you know. Everybody's got responsibilities but me. Excuse me, Lieutenant. <laughs> yes, Padre. Why am I here? We went over that this morning. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, they tell me that this thing's got to get started with a prayer, and since you pray better than you shoot, we thought we'd let you pray. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> he says, but you got to go downstairs, you got to be fingerprinted, you got to be ID, you got to get an ID badge, you got to do what everybody else has got to do. So, wow. Okay. And he said, you can't get in without. Your ID badge on. We're around your neck today. He said, you get into anything all over Orlando, as long as you got that on, you don't have to pay to go into anything, but you have to have that on. He said, on the back, it, have, it will have your thumbprint, and they will scan that, and you'll be allowed in and out or anything. You know. So I get to the track, and I'm, Rick Ozier was down there. I said, hey, Rick, how you doing? He said, fine, Rick. And there's this guy standing beside him, and he said, this is so-and-so with the federal government. You got your badge? Yeah. Put your badge on. Okay. Turn it around, I scanned it, it went off. Okay, you come on in. See, those who are called and those who are being predestined, those have been justified. In other words, you've been passed. 
by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have the mark of the Holy Spirit on you. You don't get into heaven without being screamed. You can't get in there. That's just the way it is. When Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father with me. And, and he goes on, Paul says, that we've been given a guarantee, a deposit, which is the Holy Spirit. That's how you are recognized. You can't get past the gate. They got some big angel standing there going, next, next. You know? <laughs> and they hate for people trying to sneak into heaven because everybody don't want to be getting in. But you will be scanned. And that's a beautiful thing. Those he justified. Jesus justified us by his blood. And those he justified, he is also glorified. Glorified carries the word Shekinah in it. It's what we remember as the Shekinah glory cloud. And we were talking, Sandy was talking, we were talking about the, the Exodus the other day. I, I don't know how, how we got there. Something about I was running late and needed to move. I don't know. Something about my kids. <laughs> I needed to exit this out of the house. I don't know. But anyway, she said, she asked a question that I couldn't answer. She said, do you know how long it took the nation of Israel to cross the Red Sea? I went, hmm. Too many people time. Start doing the math. Try to figure this out. And she said, 24 hours. It took them 24 hours to get that many people across. So God did this. This is what she's telling me. God did this. He took, I knew part of this, but not all. He took the glory cloud. Remember a pillar of dust by day and a pillar of fire by night. He took the glory cloud at night and put it behind the nation of Israel. And here came the Egyptians, but they couldn't get past it. It was too bright. And I mean, horses just don't like. Well, I wouldn't either. If you saw a pillar of fire, would you like, I'm walking by? I don't think so. Because that glory cloud is just like this. It's hovering. And you're not getting past it. So the glory cloud blocked the nation of Israel from getting, I mean the uh, Egyptians, from getting to the nation of Israel. And at night they could see and walk across. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I thought, that, I thought it was cool. That same word, Shekinah, is the word glorified. You get tapped into that kind of glory. And we don't ever think about that. I mean, we really don't. We don't think about the glory of God pouring into us. We don't, you know, sometimes we see it. And, it, and it's amazing to me how it comes at just the right moment when we're not expecting it. You know, we're just singing along in a song and we're just liking it and we're just worshiping there and all of a sudden something happens. Boom! God moves. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Miracles happen when the glory of God is moving. And I absolutely believe that. I believe God can shake loose, shake up, shake down, shake us in the midst of the glory moving. That's why part of the music is so important. People talk about, well, that's just emotional. Oh, no, no, no. When you are praising God, when you are singing praises to God, when you are worshiping God, when you're coming before Him, in the song, in the, in, in the praise, glory is stirred in heaven because God is a music freak. <laughs> he loves the music. Have you read the Psalms? Oh man, David went and played. God sat up and noticed. He paid attention to what was doing what was going on when they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the and he's dancing and he ain't got no clothes on and he's singing and dancing and praising. God didn't reject that. He breathed it in. Yes, she did, Miriam. And there's some who hold to the tradition, and I'm I, I think I'm one of those. They believe that the fall of Satan happened because Satan was the choir director in heaven. We can talk about that later. But I think the proof is there. I think it's there. I think the scriptures talk about him. He was a beautiful thing. His only problem is his ego overloaded his ability. And he wanted to be God, not worship God. I mean, it's an important thing. His words are an important thing. But the glory of God just flows. And it's our job to be predestined to step into it. Called. Justified. See how I put it in order? Called you. 
You answer. Justified you at the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ. And now he says step into my glory. <clears throat> and we get to move in that direction. Next week we're going to jump into a section that says. That is all such a praise about God. That nothing. Nothing. Nothing in all of creation can separate him. When we are in that glory. When we are walking in that. There is nothing that can separate him from us. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? No one. No one. No one. It's not possible for someone to come in and separate us because we're walking in his glory. We've been called. We've been justified. We've been glorified. And he says this. Praise him. He says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We've won. We've won. The battle is over. That is not an arrogant thing because we weren't predestined to lose because Jesus was predestined to win. He won over death. He won over the grave because He was predestined and He has brought us with Him in that. So the glory is His, not ours. And if we, will, if we will stay there, if we will stay in that place and say it's not about us, it's about Him, if we will walk in that glory, then we are able to overcome because He overcame. There was nothing that could hold Jesus, nothing that could bind Jesus. And we have access to that same. The demonic world is no match for the blood of Jesus Christ. They're, they don't stand a chance. And the world, which looks like it's winning every day, you watch the news, you watch the news, you watch the, I mean, it looks like the world's winning. The world's so far behind, it'll never catch up. They may affect our lives, but they will not affect our eternity. We may be absent from the body, but we will be present with the Lord. And what a day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? <clears throat> Forces coming against us now. We watch it and we're like, oh, no. Sometimes I think if we could just in our, in our mind, in our heart, if we could see the angels that are standing around us every day. If we could see them. If we could see the sun. Standing around us. Whispering to say. Not today. It's mine. It'll always be mine. You can't put a hand on it. More. More than called. More than justified. I am a walking Chicago cloud. Because of the glory that he's revealed in me. And the glory he's revealed in you. Because when my light's dim, yours is bright. And it is a testimony. If you need Jesus Christ in your life, that's, this is the place right now we're coming to. All you have to do is ask Him. Just ask Him to come in. And He will bring what I'm talking about into your life. And it will not be a question of, I don't know. It will be a question of, I can't wait to get there. So when something happens, I'm knowing that it's going to work for my good. Because my God will never do anything that would destroy me because He can Because he honors the redemption of Jesus Christ. Now please know this. You can do something about it. He will never violate your will. But if your will is for his purpose, he will accomplish that in your life. And it begins by giving your life to him. If you are in Christ, please know that God, if you will seek his will, if you, you will walk according to his purpose, and if you don't know what that is, 
then you need to just be pressing in and seeking that. Because he's not calling us to walk on water. He's calling us to lead people to the living water. So give him thanks this morning for that. And say, Lord, today, work in my life according to your purpose. As we stand together to sing.